Halo. Halo, I'm trying. Today is a trying stream. Yeah. I miss you. Oh, <laughs> what the fuck is this? Wait, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? This. What the fuck is this? Did you know of these secrets most players missed in Fallout 3? When initially encountering Moira in Fallout 3, Players have the option to persuade her to abandon her plan of writing the Wasteland Survival Guide. However, this particular dialogue option is often skipped by players, and the unique dialogue never gets heard. You... you really think so? But... but I thought I was so brilliant! I suppose you're right. I wouldn't want anyone else to get hurt because of my foolish ideas. I'll just stick to helping the caravans. Hey, if you're ever around again, stop by. I'll see if I can get you a deal on repairs, I guess. Passing this speech Dream check will result culture. in a 30% discount on her wares and an increase of her repair skill from 24 to 54. Karma will be lost, but the Dream Crusher perk is given to the player character. Did you know of these secrets most players- You see this bullshit above me? Mel is literally- the four star everyone gets for free at the beginning and never uses on their team. Shake my hand in character. Oh, okay. Shake my hand. Solo? White boy Carl? Okay. Star Wars canon has made one of the most famous legend ships pretty much completely useless. Have you heard of the Victory Class Star Destroyer? No, this isn't the ship you see in the main Star Wars movies. This was a smaller vessel first created by the Republic during the Clone Wars. The Victory was largely supplanted by the ISD, but still saw service across the galaxy, and it had a very unique ability. According to the Imperial Sourcebook and later materials, the Victory Star Destroyer was the largest and most powerful vessel which could operate in a planet's atmosphere. So, despite being slow and probably underarmed, the Victory Star Destroyer had a very unique and important role as a planetary assault ship. You see these bits on the VSD? These were called atmospheric maneuvering flaps. Now, I say Star Wars can has made the ship useless because in canon now, pretty much any ship can operate in atmosphere. That's been the case since Revenge of the Sith. So, the Victory goes from being a unique planetary assault ship to just a crappy Star Destroyer. Star Wars. I found an illegal way to grow taller. I get made fun of for my height. Russia claims that Ukraine tried to assassinate Putin with two drones last night. With those drones hitting the top of the Kremlin. And Russia saying they regard these actions as a planned terrorist act and an attempt on Putin's life even though he wasn't there at the time. Now Ukraine has denied this saying that they didn't attack the Kremlin and that this is proof that Russia is going to conduct a large scale terrorist provocation in the coming days. Meanwhile, the US says that you should take everything that comes from Russia with a grain of salt and that they can't validate Russia's claim. But Russia is now saying that there are no options left except the physical elimination of Zelensky and his clique. The US is warning its citizens of an increased risk of missiles in Kyiv now that Russia is deliberately aiming for 
citizens. Russia hit a U.S. drone with an anti-air missile in November of last year. In other news, the Russian army and the Wagner Group are back to fighting each other on the battlefield instead of Ukraine. NATO is opening an office in Japan to deepen its ties into the Asia Pacific, with NATO saying that no partner is closer or more capable than Japan. Ukraine saying it's a de facto member of NATO. Through Japan's uh, Giga Chan. And Russia says that the U.S. wants to take over Russia in case the Yellowstone volcano explodes. Which I'd say, I think a lot of Americans would rather die from a volcano than live in Russia. I mean, not even Russia wants to live in Russia. That's why they keep invading their neighbors. Follow to stay in the loop. Russia claims that you... Here's what happened in VTubing last week in about 60 seconds. Peppa hit 100k on YouTube and was forced to do an entire stream dedicated to showing her feet because it's the internet and people are relentlessly down bad. Kali released a new <laughs> album and while there was some drama involving aunties, I'd rather not focus on that and instead tell you to go listen to the album because it absolutely slaps. Drama the Anners hosted a Minecraft Twitch Rivals event featuring 18 competitors in a race to not die the fastest. Most of them were VTubers, but there were a few, I think they're called real people, included. There were some awesome new model and outfit debuts, including Juniper's because the girl never sleeps, and Fauna's new nerd outfit. This was one of the only good things to happen to Hollow EN this week, since literally everyone is either sick or on hiatus. Seriously, I think there are like four talents still streaming at the moment. And finally, you've oh, probably wow. heard, but Yugo Asuma of Niji Sanji was unfortunately forced to graduate earlier this week. And rather than speculate about the specific reasons, I'd prefer to just wish them the best. Though I'm sure they'll be amazing at whatever they choose to move on to. Robbery, give me everything! I can't. What? I can't. I will blow your head you see that ladder over there? It's been there for 200 years and nobody can move it. Because if anybody does, they might start a war. Let me explain. This is the Church of the uh... Holy Sepulchre. And Christians believe that Jesus was crucified here. Because of that, many Christian groups had fights for years over who owns this building. Until 160 years ago, six groups signed an agreement to share the ownership of the building. In that agreement, it says that nothing in the church church can be changed unless the six groups approve it. The problem is they can never agree on anything. In 2002, one monk moved a chair and because it was not approved by all six groups, it started a fight that ended up with 12 monks in the hospital. But his ladder was there before they signed the agreement. Nobody even knows to whom it belongs. Until they can agree to move it, it will remain right there. Focus the fuck. I'm gonna watch this. I'm going to kill myself. I don't understand. I'm going to kill myself. Excuse me. You're Tony Sopranos. This is day four, digging in a 150-year-old dump, looking for expensive whiskey bottles. As I got deeper in the dump, the bottles are much more frequent. This is a Lee and Perrin's bottle from around 1860. I found tons of these bottlenecks while I was digging, and I got my hopes up each time. Hey, that's not a bottle, it's a shoe. <laughs> this one also got my hopes up, but no dice. I saw a tweet the other day that said Nintendo recommends charging once every six months. If the state of not charging or Jane, I'm gonna go to the bathroom. Will you shiny hunt for me? This new report says that Ukraine tried to assassinate Putin with a drone. Though unfortunately, if true, they failed. Russia How to drop bolts. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, she's... <laughs> I 
I have cameras around Japan. Why? Here's what happened in VTubing last week in about 60 seconds. Pippa hit 100k on YouTube and... Okay. Okay, go into draw. Go into draw. Let's map. Let's do Alright, I'm gonna draw. I'm gonna draw. I'm gonna draw. I'm gonna draw. Don't worry, it's not gonna draw. But I have two poses. I have two poses. I have pose one and pose two. What the fuck? Okay, let's do this one. Let's do this one. Okay, let's do this one. I can, I can see it in my head. Show that. Increase it a little bit. There we go. I don't want to get copy strike. I don't want to get copy strike again. Shh. Oh shit, am I? Oh my god. I'm going in.
everybody please put down your pitchforks and delete your angry tweets. Close your Reddit karma farming accounts for the hate threads. I'm here. The sheriff is back in town. I know many of you concerned civilians were worried that I had gone to the store to get milk and cigarettes and I had forgotten something very important and I wasn't coming home for it. And of course I'm talking about my $10,000 speedrun bounty challenges that I said I'd want to do monthly every month this year. The astute observers amongst you may have noticed that it's been longer than a month since my last $10,000 speedrun challenge. And there's a good reason for this. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, this year I wanted to set out to do a $10,000 speedrun challenge on an obscure game at least once a month. And we had a good streak going where I got it twice on time. However, the most recent one, Exodus from the Earth, was such a banger that I've spent the last month and a half, almost two months, just looking for a game that's nearly as good to speedrun as Exodus from the Earth. Of course, I posted the complete Summoning Salt style history of these speedrun challenges, so definitely check those bad boys out, they go hard. And I've got great news today because it's time to announce the third $10,000 speedrun bounty we found another candidate, one that's worthy to follow up Exodus from the Earth, a sacred battleground for which only the most talented of gamer barbarians will fight and succeed, and that game is Elder Scrolls Adventures Redguard. That's right, we're gonna take you back to the past to play a shitty game and eat ass. This puppy is from 1998 and is actually listed as one of the reasons why Bethesda went into a downward spiral in the late 90s because it was such a fucking commercial flop. Many of you watching this know of the Elder Scrolls series, probably one of the most well-known series in all of gaming, but I guarantee only a handful of you have ever heard of Elder Scrolls Adventures Redguard. This is like the bonus Jonas brother that no one remembers. The game just was not really played often, though the people that did play it liked it. It was actually like, moderately received well it had good reviews for the most part but it's not a popular game by any means and in fact as of right now there's only a single run for this game and it's the current world record so there's already an established route to follow and it's it's kind of a wild one it's it's a bit long too so really fuckle your seat belt now i know some of you might be a little intimidated by the hour and 50 plus minute route right now but it's important to keep in mind that Last time, for Exodus from the Earth, the world record was an hour and 15 minutes roughly, and by the end of the speedrun challenge, the record was 20 minutes, around 20 minutes. So there's so much room for improvement on these games, and the glitches and tech that get found are amazing. Now, if you followed okay, this so series that I've been doing with the speedrun bounties, you already know the rules, but I'll go over them one more time here, of course. It's going to be two weeks. So at the end of two weeks, whoever has the fastest time wins, obviously. It's a $10,000 prize pool split across first, second, and third. And I'm also, again, doing the same thing I did last time, which was the $1,000 uh, bonus bounty for whoever finds the most important glitch or most meta-defining trick. I like to incentivize glitch hunters, so even if you're not the most talented speedrunner, if you're like the craftiest and most creative glitch hunter and you find something that's used in the route extensively, you can win a thousand dollars. Last time that went to the person who found the huge skip in the beginning of the game that pretty much single-handedly sliced the run in half. So there's just a lot of fun to be had here. I love doing these challenges and it's nice to finally find another game that should be a fun one to watch. Now per usual your run needs to have video evidence, preferably streamed on Twitch or YouTube or something and you submit the VOD to us to be verified. And also Kronos, whom many of you know from the previous challenges, he helps moderate the Discord as well as go through the runs, verify things, and learn everything there is to learn about these challenges. Kronos has already made a tutorial on how to set up everything for Elder Scrolls Adventures Redguard and get everyone on even playing field. There's also been incredible work from the community done already for Auto Splitter and everything, so all of the hard work's already been done for you. It should be a pretty seamless, easy start here if you want to uh, participate in the challenge and the bounty. So yeah, no, no headache there. I'm gonna put a link to the video in the description of this video, so that way you can get the tutorial and get set up. And I'm also going to put a link to the Discord where pretty much everything about this challenge will be held. That's discussions with community members, speed tech, uh, hypothesizing routes and glitches, submitting runs, and just basically going over everything about this game and this challenge. So once again, two weeks starting from today, ending at midnight two weeks from now. 
Whoever has the fastest time wins. Uh, of course, you can use any glitches and exploits you find in the game, but there will be no third party modifications or any cheating like that. So yeah, it's time to get started. Let's hop back in the saddle here. And also, once again, I'm sorry this is so late. I really did want to do this like every month, but we really hit a diamond in the rough immediately with Exodus from the Earth. The first speedrun bounty was for Amok Runner, right? Like, that was a wacky speedrun game that was so fucking, <laughs> like, awful for runners to run. Like, it, it was only up from there. But when we did Exodus from the Earth as our second one, I don't think we realized just how good of a speed game it turned out to be. And it, I don't like going backwards, so like, Exodus from the Earth was amazing. I wouldn't want to just choose another stinker, kind of like Amok Runner's route. Like, I wanted to, like, just keep going up, or at least maintain the same level of quality that, w that we saw with Exodus from the Earth. So, it's just been a long time going through a ton of games, looking for anything that might have that, that same level potential. And then we finally found Red Guard here, so I'm optimistic. Hopefully it turns into an amazing speed game. I'm hoping the route can get down to like fucking 20 minutes just like uh, uh, Exodus from the Earth did. So yeah, uh, once again, sorry for the big delay on that. And yeah, that's about it. Looking forward to watching all of your runs in this competition. See ya. Let's watch the other uh, previous one. I haven't watched the previous one yet. Let's see. This uh, is... Uh, wait, what is this? That's new. I never seen that. What's the video for that? <laughs> What's the video for that? Did it happen a month ago? talked about something that I feel a lot of people overlook, and it's the importance of stuntmen. Their work is some of the most important in all of movies in general, and I always True. have such a deep appreciation for the art, especially growing up on things like Jackie Chan movies, I've always paid very close attention to stunt work. And today I saw a video on Twitter that really just inspired me, tickled my Elmo, and made me want to just talk about this because this stunt guy is a goddamn hero and he may very well be immortal. Three, two, one, action! When I first watched this, I thought they just oh, tossed a doll down the stairs like a, a dummy in order to make it look like someone got thrown down the stairs. Until the very end, I realized, holy shit, that's a living, breathing human being there that just got thrown down the escalator. The dude got fucking potato sacked, thrown out like a trash bag, a slinky going down the escalator here. So then I watched it back and I was like, okay, maybe he's in like some kind of full body suit of medieval armor to help with the impact here. Kind of like that guy who built the anti-grizzly bear suit and he used to like get hit by trucks and shit to prove how strong it was. But then I realized he's not doing that either. He does have some kind of like padding on himself, but it's kind of light. He looks like one of Shredder's ninjas from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So while there is padding there, it's not like he's in some kind of juggernaut bomb defusal squad uniform here. It's it's pretty light. And it is a, it seems to be a real escalator. I don't know what you can really do to modify an escalator to make falling like that hurt less. Even if each one of those steps was a memory foam pillow, it would still hurt quite a bit because that's a long fall. And he does a few tumbles there. He like lands on the back of his neck uh, on like that second one there. 
So, you know, it seems like a pretty risky stunt, but I have no doubt this guy probably did this with a fucking smile on his face because stuntmen are actual warriors. They're, they're fucking champions out True. there. I also wonder how many takes they've done of this. Like, this is probably like take number 12. It's like, hey, the first 11 were okay, but you weren't flailing around enough, and we really want, like, almost a neck-breaking action when you're falling, so we're gonna do this again until we can get that effect. You know, like, they probably did this multiple times of him just getting fucking tomato canned down this escalator. It honestly kind of reminds me of that iCarly scene where Gibby falls from, like, the, the roof onto just bare concrete. Uh, we had Noah Monk on the podcast who played Gibby in that show, and he said that that was done for real. A stuntman actually just fucking, like, belly flopped onto concrete and broke, like, all of his ribs. And so when you see that impact of uh, Gibby bouncing off the cement, that's a real person that that happened to, and his ribs paid the ultimate fucking price for it. I have no doubt this is probably just as real, but somehow this guy seems like, okay. Gibby had to be taken off on a stretcher after that. The stuntman, he had to be, like, goddamn taken out there, like, nearly had to call him the, the chopper rescue unit to airlift him out. Meanwhile, this guy probably just walked it off, rubbed some dirt in it. Like, it's crazy. Stuntmen are actually super, super impressive, and I really hope they're being paid well for John Wick 4 here. This got me even more excited for John Wick than I already was seeing a stunt like this. They didn't take some kind of easy way out with, like, CGI or using some kind of, like, animatronic or doll or something. They actually just had an absolute madman do this stunt for real, and that is super fucking cool. Anyway, this wasn't the only thing I saw on Twitter that was inspirational. I saw something that was honestly a tear-jerking moment that I kind of just want to share with all of you. This is like a little bonus that I'd like to dive into. The fuck is uh, recently, happening? Hasbullah has been on this absolute blow-up. He's, he's really popping off. Most people know who that is by now. He's got a very strong social media presence, and people love him. And from everything I've seen, Hasbullah seems like a really nice, likable guy. And he recently went on Mike Tyson's podcast, Mike Tyson's show, and uh, things things got real interesting real quick. Oh yeah, I saw that on Twitter. That's so Since cringe. our I'm ancient skipping. ancestors flopped onto the land so many millions of years ago, uh, we've steadily ew. evolved, constantly developing, improving, and leading us to this very moment. Millions of years of fine-tuned evolution has finally paid off as we're able to compete in my $10,000 speedrun challenges. Let's and my most go. recent one was the most challenging for our species yet. Thanks to this, I finally pushed us to reach the apotheosis of evolution itself. This is the world record history of Exodus from the Earth, the most recent $10,000 speedrun challenge that I put out into the wild. The game is so goddamn easy. No fucking way. This game's similar to Crisis, yeah, you could say that. It's a real gem from its era. I'm sure I don't even need to explain what Exodus from the Earth is, one of the biggest games of all time. It came to the US in 2008 and blessed all of our home computers with its glory. 2008 is only a year after Halo 3 came out and I can still remember the conundrum of, should I buy Halo 3? or fucking exodus from the earth. Yeah, they say Crispy's taken over all companies producing tan lotion. I don't know why he did it. I, of course I'm exaggerating, I'm kidding around. The game is a hidden gem that I'm pretty sure me and only like 10 other people in the world have played. It came out originally in Russia in 2007, but didn't come to the States till 08. The plot is centered around the Earth being in trouble in the year 2016, that fucking far future dystopian year. In 2016, the sun becomes a red giant, which is burning all the life on the planet to a crisp. And the solution is to find a habitable planet. <laughs> so in a panic, they spec all of their points into space exploration to try and quickly find a habitable Earth-like planet. And meanwhile, the Axe Corporation develops a vaccine they claim will allow humans to live in hostile environments. The purpose being, you can take this vaccine and then live in a previously uninhabitable planet that they've discovered. But, suspicion starts to arise because its sinister leader, Jack Crisby, and Axe Corporation itself, are suspected of being behind the disappearance of an astronaut who had just returned from space with news of a second Earth. I, I, I know, and we're only halfway through the plot right now. Your toes are probably curling in euphoria with how great the narrative is. So, 
he, they get investigated, and you play as that undercover agent, Frank Rickson. Typical tough guy with a stock of one-liners and an almost fetishistic love of firearms. I didn't write that line, this is in the official summary of the game, because I wanted to see what they had to say about good old fucking Frank here. And so, you play as Frank Rickson, he's investigating, and it turns into an absolute goddamn bloodbath. Uh, people getting slaughtered all over the place as you're trying to... Uh, investigate and take down Jack Crisby and the gang. Honestly, this is work that rivals Tolkien's narratives. I mean, now that you're all brought up to speed on this riveting plot, uh, I'd like to explain how I even found this game. It was during a Steam summer sale like six or seven years ago now. It was like five cents and I thought it looked interesting enough for a few pennies, so I bought it. And I made two YouTube videos on it, and I actually enjoyed it and had fun with it. So I thought this would be a good target for the next $10,000 speedrun challenge following the completion of my last one, A Mock Runner, which I already made this Summoning Salt style video for last month. Now, this game was very different from A Mock Runner in the fact that there's more to do, there's more mechanics, as opposed to A Mock Runner, where the only thing you can do is slowly walk forward while your character monologues about how unprofessional he's being. This game is actually just kind of fun. It's very Half-Life-esque is how I always think of it and how I describe it. And the speedrun is beyond exciting. And another great thing about this one for the challenge was there was already a template to follow. Because on day zero, there was already a speedrun record that had taken place in 2018. There was only one person that ever ran this game before this challenge. His name is Deluxe. Deluxe in 2018 had actually optimized an extremely impressive speedrun route for this game. Deluxe is really the patient zero for Exodus from the Earth speedrunning. So let's take a look. The first record from Deluxe was set on February 7th of 2018 with a 1 hour, 32 minute, 20 second speedrun. And it's actually pretty impressive. It's not just playing the game normally fast. Deluxe had already found some pretty big skips, and some skips that got used all the way up until the end of the challenge, especially in the early early levels. Like, th there was just an incredible amount of polish to the speed run that Deluxe was cooking up. The second record that Deluxe posted was on April 9th of 2018 with a 1 hour, 20 minute, 20 second speed run, so already improved it by 12 minutes, finding even more optimizations. And I'd like to briefly go over some of the tricks that he started using. So he had found a trash can skip where you would use a trash can as kind of like a prop boost in order to skip some parts of the level. He'd also then use an explosion skip. As well as an early car out of bounds. Finding out of bounds this early while being the only runner is extremely impressive because he wasn't competing with anyone. He was just doing this for the fucking love of the sport. An absolute madman. And his work is the foundation for the speed run itself. So finding it out of bounds already with the car is fantastic since the car is by far the biggest headache in the entire run. He then also found a gate skip. A satellite skip. And a lot of other very small optimizations like quick save spamming, cutscene skips, save loading. Like, there was a lot that he used that was used all the way up till the end. So, throughout 2018, he competed with just himself setting his own records. So, the third record that he set was on April 29th of 2018, getting a 1 hour, 18 minute, 8 second run. Then that same day, getting a 1 hour, 13 minute, 33 second run. And then the following month in May, May 15th, 2018, he posts his last and final Exodus from the Earth speed run record with a 1 hour, 10 minute, 13 second run. Overall, it was an extremely impressive run considering it was just him running it. So he was doing all of this on his own. And he kept theorycrafting big skips, including the biggest skip the game would ever see. The Chapter 13 skip. This was a skip that would happen at the very beginning of this run that would skip from the fucking very start, like the primordial ooze of Exodus from the Earth, all the way to chapter 13, using an out-of-bounds clip. He theorized it, but couldn't quite crack the code on how to make it all work. But he laid that groundwork 
where people did eventually find that. And I'll get into it in a moment. I want to follow the timeline one to one. Point is, Deluxe was an absolute pioneer with this game. So, having that as the template for day zero, I posted the $10,000 challenge and people got to work. This is a much larger game than Amok Runner. Playing this game normally is going to take quite a few hours and there is a lot going on. It's very action heavy, a lot of shooting. The driving is unforgiving because it feels like you're driving an absolute fucking disheveled, drunken zombie of a car. It doesn't do what you want it to do. Its momentum uh -huh. carries in weird ways. It gets pushed around by light breezes. It's fucking miserable. So there is a lot of learning that needed to go into this game. And that's really what day one was about. Most players spent day one just playing the game normally as best they can, getting familiar with the shooting mechanics and all of that, getting familiar with the route which was already established. But we did however see a new record on day one itself from a familiar face that you're going to recognize from the AMOC challenge, Spicy TV. Spicy TV within uh -huh. 24 hours after the announcement actually did get a new world record with a 56 minute and 8 second run. There wasn't any huge changes to the route, Spicy TV just did the established route better, but with some new tricks thrown in, sprinkled here and there for flavor, but nothing massive. I'll go over a couple of the day one tricks that were found. The first and by far most entertaining trick is crouch spamming. People discovered that if you just spam crouch, none of the enemies can actually do damage to you. You're pretty much immortal when you're spamming crouch and getting shot by enemies, everything misses. It's extremely goofy, and I love it. I think it's amazing. So that saved a lot of time because you could just start avoiding enemies or surviving things that ordinarily you wouldn't survive oh, because even indeed. on like <laughs> the best of days, the game is pretty unforgiving with the amount of damage it'll do to you out of nowhere. Like you'll step on like a single twig and break your whole leg, die instantly. Like you will just die like instantaneously like spontaneously can bust out of nowhere in this game so being able to crouch spam to avoid a couple bullets that might have just instantly killed you for some reason was a life saver and an absolute game changer so that was discovered pretty quickly another skip that was discovered on day one was tig skip named after the person that found it tig they found if you pressed Control plus i you'd teleport forward it was a developer command that was left in the game but it only worked on one specific level so you couldn't just spam it for everything, but it was helpful in the spot that it worked. They also found a raft and conveyor skip. It was found by Zumo de Papaya. They found that in the same car cutscene skip, if you exit and enter the vehicle as you into the water, and then drive to the left of the mountain and maneuver back in bounds, you can skip the long auto scroller. So this level fucking sucks. There is an auto scrolling segment here, and being able to skip it what? would be a huge time saver a, a massive one and just it cut out a lot of boring shit and luckily it was found pretty much instantly so if you enter and exit the vehicle right as it touches the water here you can then drive to the left of the mountain out of bounds and then get back in bounds to skip all of that dog shit and now we move on to day two which by far had the most craziness happen so i mentioned that chapter 13 skip that deluxe had theorized right well, the community was hard at work on trying to make that dream a reality. They worked tirelessly on trying to crack that. This is the C-13 uh, uh, sequence break okay, in fine. Exodus from the Earth. I'm so what is going on? Today I'll be teaching you chapter 13 skip. This is going to be the new chapter 13 skip or 13.5. Because if you could do that chapter 13 skip, you would cut about 20 minutes out of this run. So this one trick would nearly cut this run in half on its own. So the community was working together, it was a collaborative effort, but was ultimately put all together into this nice cauldron of beautiful tasty stew by On Trigger. On Trigger put all of the methods together and figured out the way of making it work. So to break it down, the first method was to make a save on the elevator and then use a chair to clip upwards into the ceiling and fall down which would skip right to chapter 13. This was a combination of Albert Hammock discovering item prop climbing up the hand in the center of the room. This is the first major trick used in the run. You go grab a chair, you turn it a certain way, and then you use it to surf up this hand in the middle of the room to get to the second story. And then Vexedros found a momentum carry through saves, where moving objects carry weird momentum for your character so what you would do is you would then get into this elevator and basically store a lot of momentum from moving the objects in there 
and it would then use that to clip into the ceiling and fall down to skip to chapter 13. This was in its infancy, so these were the early days of chapter 13 skip, so a lot of people didn't understand exactly how it worked, so it led to a lot of people struggling with it when clipping out of bounds and all that. So it was kind of deemed too RNG right now to be run viable, but it was there, it was discovered, and later that same day, a lot of records started, started to happen. People started to gamble on chapter 13 skip because there wasn't a reason not to. This isn't a trick that comes in towards the end of the run where the pressure's on and if you fuck it up you have to reset the whole thing and go all the way back. This is something that takes place at the actual very beginning of the game. So it's only like a minute into the run so a lot of people just decided even though we don't fully understand it or have the most consistent setup it's worth at least trying it. And it only got more consistent as the runs went on. But day two saw a lot of shaking and baking. So we had our first world record using the chapter 13 skip. It came from Joe Gnome with a 53 minute 59 second run. It's not the most optimized run in the world, but god damn it, it's the first one that clocked it with the chapter 13 skip. And then we had an absolute flurry of world records being traded. These were all within five minutes of each other. There were three records. First, Came from Joe Gnome again with a 50 minute 8 second run. Alright, we know the strat. Well, we know a strat. We don't know the strat. Oh. 50.08. And then we have a returning raid boss, the previous world champion of the $10,000 speedrun bounties, Ouija. Ouija was the winner of last month's AMOC Runner $10,000 challenge and he came back to defend the title. So Ouija made his presence known by clocking in a 48 minute, 41 second run. Do I go? Wow, what a great run. Which was then absolutely fucking demolished by Spicy TV, who came around and fucking slapped the meat down, laying in a 38 minute, six second run. Not bad for a first run with the fucking pair skip shit. This run was actually spectacular. This early into the competition, the record had already been chopped almost <laughs> in half from an hour to 38 minutes. So Spicy definitely had the most optimized run at the time, implemented all the tricks pretty much flawlessly and just had the most mechanical expertise with it so far. So day two, he was really kind of popping off. He then, an hour later, got another world record, dropping it even further, with a 35 minute, 35 second run. I lost time even though I didn't down robots because of that. GG's though. Two in a row. Not bad. This one was definitely a lot better than the last one. Like, the skips were, were pretty decent in this one. But now, we need to clear the stage for yet another galactic demon level threat of speedrunning. Unity B. Unity is a top tier source speedrunner. He is very well known in the scene. This man was basically fucking created in a test tube in a lab. Combined all of the genes of the best speedrunners of all time and put into one person. Rolled up into a fucking monstrous package. Unity B came in after practicing the run for... I don't even remember how long, but he wasn't at it for very long. Came in and got a 33 hour 12 second world record. He also started incorporating bunny hopping into the speed run. Bunny hopping is a term I'm sure you're very familiar with. It's optimized movement. When you do bunny hopping correctly, you move faster than any other ways of traversing. So the way you bunny hop in Exodus from the Earth is you strafe left to right. It, it's no different than most other bunny hopping. It just looks a little wonky in Exodus from the Earth, but it's fundamentally the same thing. You're, you're strafing left, right, you know, holding DA, holding A, all that. If you know bunny hopping and other source games, you know it in Exodus. It just looks very silly in this one, in my opinion, but I think that adds to the charm. We're only 48 hours into this son of a bitch, and it's already getting scarily optimized. You have people bunny hopping, spamming crouch to avoid damage, grabbing props to jump over triggers and skips, going through entire fucking chapters, skips, doing crazy shit. It is a beautiful sight to behold. And day three, they decided to tackle another issue entirely. Shut the fuck up! The performance. <laughs> the game has performance problems, in specific, a memory leak issue. And that was a big pain point for a lot of people because sometimes the game would just straight up crash. 
and people within the community actually developed a speedrun patch to fix it. So it would stop it from crashing due to a memory overload in the later half of the game. What would happen is during one part of the run, there was a point where you'd kill enemies and it would overload the memory of the game and cause it to just completely shit itself. Which is disastrous for a speedrun, especially a $10,000 competition speedrun. So the community worked together to actually patch this and fix it. There's a lot of credit to give for this one. What? The main contributors, as I understand it, are Zach777, another returning face from the AMOC challenge from last month, one of the top runners there. Egg and Banana Stan, they all narrowed down on the issue. And then Sky Rimfist created the patch, and Magma Slime 569, Sizable Shrimp, and Man in Black tested it. <laughs> there were also other contributors as well, such as like Artemis. Uh, th there was just a lot of people that came together to fix this in order to make this better, uh, the experience better, so that way people weren't having these fucking crashes and ruining the run. So, the patch comes out day three. We, of course, allow for the patch because obviously I don't want this to be just some like RNG crash fest. Like, that sucks. I understand that it's not as the game shipped, but. You know what? Fuck it. You know, it's our competition. We, we can get a little wacky and goofy, a little loosey-goosey with the rules. Yes, wacky it is a third-party thing because it's a patch, but it just fixes the base game itself because it's shipped in such a poor state. So, we allow the patch for the runners to play on it. Uh, after the community rejoices and everyone gets back to running. So, now, let's talk about the next couple of days. Days 3 through 5. Unity gets yet another world record with a 31-minute, one-second run. <laughs> Kickflip, kickflip, fucking burnout paradise. Bowel. What the fuck? Jesus Christ. Fuck. Dude. So close to 30. This uses a lot of new skips now. So we've introduced something called Dam Skip, which was found by Zach, based on what we've learned from that. So it gets pretty close to the roof. If we could, if we could like pinch through here, we would end up in this room. Uh, this room is basically the end, right? We would then just go through here, call the elevator, or let this guy do it, take the elevator down, and that's basically the entire level. So the idea was you would clip through this ceiling on top of this car, which would skip the entire dam section. This run also included the new wet skip, which was found by <laughs> Latanda. Uh, first thing you need to do is you need to drive across this trigger, so if you were to reload, awesome. then you would respawn on the island. Okay, tits, right? Um, admittedly, I don't know exactly where this trigger is still, but it seems yeah, to be somewhere around fine. here. Um, after that, we're not going to respawn on the island. We're instead going to basically drive around okay. the entire island. Uh, but this method... Um, drives essentially right to the end and then you utilize the fact that you respawn right in the crane to do the crane task and then your quick save puts you right back at the end. This combined the crane skip and the conveyor and raft skip. Uh, the crane skip, I'll briefly explain, was you would launch your car right at this crane and try and basically fucking front flip over it or even off to the side and you would skip a good portion of this run. Uh, just more of a headache. It's just another optimized time save. The crane skip was also extremely frustrating for a lot of people, but necessary. The wet skip combines both that and the conveyor and raft skip, so what you would do is you would drive out of bounds, you would hit some of the triggers, and then you would reset the car's position to teleport inbounds. Then you would do the crane skip and load the previous save when you hit the trigger to then reset the car. And because of the way the trigger checkpoints work, resetting the car position with the crane checkpoint warps you forward, skipping a lot of the driving. So the wet skip was just another huge time save and just this amalgamation of a couple of other skips that came before it and combined it into something even better. Another new skip was being used called brownie skip which was found by controlled alt delicious. This is one that was theorized all the way back in the beginning of time by Deluxe, the prophet. And basically it's some tricky platforming to get out of bounds and then you jump down to the next section and live by dropping your frame rate by switching it to a lower value or mashing quick save or you can just get lucky and jump at the frame perfect time. This was just another nice optimized time skip by abusing the quick save mechanic. So if you're mashing quick save, you can pretty much live most things when it comes to like dropping down and shit. There's just a lot of goofiness to the tech here. So these were three new skips that were being experimented with, implemented into runs, and it got the time down even further. Spicy got a 30 minute 43 second run and this i honestly think was a work of beauty i i watched the majority of this one live how hard is the run it's like a solid seven maybe it's not the hardest run in the world but it's 
pretty technical. That was so fucking slow. Whatever. Uh, it's still record. That was so bad though. Fuck, man. I don't even know what I could have done for that. that even if that was fine, that still wasn't sub 30, but. Later on, Unity got a 29 minute, seven second run, our first sub 30. And I hope it doesn't, cause this is like the perfect mix of, like you actually have to know how to do it and also not just full 1 billion percent randomness. That's so wacky. Fuck off! Let's fucking go! Haha! <laughs> that was so close to sub 29, what the fuck? I didn't think I could go that much lower. <laughs> Cracking the sub 30 milestone. Something that, in the beginning, I'll be honest, I wasn't even sure it was possible. This was an hour long run, and I was wondering if it was already so optimized we might not see any huge improvements. Maybe it'd get down to like 40 minutes. But we're already deep in the sub 30s, baby. We're fucking exploring parts unknown. So, Unity gets the first sub-30, 29 minutes, 7 seconds. Unity then comes back and beats his own record with a 28 minute, 29 second run. And then we get another Titan into the fray. Another behemoth into the scene. Muti. Muti is another very well-established speedrunner who entered this competition and made his presence felt in a big way. His spiritual pressure was crumpling people. But unfortunately, his big run at this time was 0.1 second slower than Unity's world record. Muti got a 28 minute, 29 second run. But I thought it was worth mentioning here because this is the first time Muti got himself in contention for the number one spot. But it would be far from the last. GG. Oh, Not bad. Not a bad run. Sucker. <sighs> Two seconds behind. Now, let's go ahead and start talking about Day 6. Day 6 starts using something called the Chunka Warp. The Chunka Warp lets you skip an entire stair section, and it's done by hitting the cutscene to start the chapter, and then getting to the end of the mission by resetting your position to the start of the game by loading a save that's there. You're going to notice a lot of these tricks use a lot of quick saving and even save load tricks, because there is so much jank to this game, that you can really get some crazy results with these save loads. So, after loading that save that's there, the old version had you die in the cutscene by using a grenade launcher shot into the trigger, and then loading the last possible quick save that you make, which is a black screen, and if you do all of this correctly, you can just walk to the end of the mission. Muti gets a world record at 27 minutes 56 seconds and uses this version of the chunk of war. I am idiot. Could have been quicker. Whatever. We'll get better at this. Ooh. No, we didn't. Okay. Fine. Oh, oh, no. Fresh meat. Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> that fucking time loss. <laughs> the grenade. <laughs> However, this was improved later. The final version of the trick, the prime version used the upclip method, which is of course momentum carrying that we talked about earlier. So you would upclip and then you jump below the cutscene trigger to die from fall damage. And then you'd skip the cutscene by mashing quick save as you die, load the black screen to quick save and continue. And you basically get the same effect, but it's more consistent and it's a lot easier. So all versions from Unity's 26 minute 57 second record does this. We finish this run now for splits. I, should. I mean, if this game, if this run, like, if I lose like a minute and a half, I'm not gonna fucking finish it, but we'll see. I got just naded himself! That guy's helping me out! Sub 27, let's fucking go. <sighs> that could have been so much better, man. That could have been nearly sub 26. These warps became integral to the run. You're going to notice quite a few of them, and they do get a little confusing. I don't know if my explanation has done it justice, but hopefully by watching it, as well as my little fucking <laughs> reptile smooth brain understanding of it, 
hopefully that's enough to get across how it works. Oh, wow. So now we're coming up on a week since the competition started. Really days seven through 10 saw even more glitches and tricks being discovered to continue pushing this into just absolutely outrageous territory. So we have something called the Subalines Wormhole. So my goal is to make sure that the moment I enter the vehicle, it will load me like that. Okay, so if you see it load instantly, that is, it worked. Now I think if I hit reset right now, make sure it grabs a checkpoint here. Subulines wormhole. Hopefully I didn't fuck your name up. So this wormhole works by entering the car and loading into the next section of the game at the same time. You can cause a wormhole glitch with the car's reset function. The reset function is something I've mentioned already, but I'll briefly explain a little bit more. The game has a built-in reset. So, you can cause a wormhole glitch by abusing that mechanic. The game will keep teleporting you ahead when you reach a certain point by loading a save with the car in the resetting position state. To do this right, you have to enter the next area, reset your car's position, and then make a save. Then you drive to a certain point, load the save, and you'll teleport forward. Repeat this all the way to the dam and you save almost a minute of driving time. And at this point, a minute means the world. Mickey R clocked a 26 minute 41 second run and was the first person to use the wormhole. And all the future runs will also be using it, but Mickey was the first one to put it all together and get a great fucking run out of it. What? Oh my god. <laughs> Dude, no fucking way. Oh my god. Another trick that started being implemented was called Dirt Skip. Basically, Dirt Skip is letting you save a keycard that would normally be used, and it saves roughly 20 seconds, which, again, at this point, is huge. This is a game of inches now. These seconds mean everything. So you pull this off by dropping onto this dirt block, making a save, and then making a save next to another block of dirt at the correct time. You then load the previous save and quick load and press quick save twice quickly. And if you do it correctly, you'll warp into the end area. And sometimes you can even jump inside as well if you didn't get teleported directly in. And we're only getting started with the glitches and tricks here. I hope you brought an appetite because if you like glitches and tricks, you're eating fucking good with Exodus from the Earth here. I wasn't exaggerating. Nearly every millisecond of this run has a trick or is setting up for a trick. So the next one is the reactor up clip and it actually uses and builds upon the same mechanics as the chapter 13 skip with the chair and using the elevator and making a quick save. So you use the chair, use the elevator, make a quick save, keep your momentum, and then you can use a trash can to boost yourself into the ceiling into the next section of the game. So now let's talk about some of the world records that Oops. were obtained using some of these already. We had Unity getting a 25 minute 49 second run. We had Unity getting a 25 minute 18 second run. Fuck. <laughs> we had Unity getting a 24 minute 40 second run. Go, dude. <laughs> oh. I'm coming. <laughs> That's massive. G fucking G. I think you're starting to notice a pattern. Unity's out there playing patty cake with his own world oh. records right now. And these runs are beautiful. I mean, just look at how these are going. Ten. It was eighteen. Oh, dude. But it wasn't just Unity, there were still so many other talented runners that weren't far behind and in fact, even leaped ahead. We had Zack, yes, Zack, with a 24 minute 38 second speedrun squeaking out a stinker to get the world record here from Unity. 
And then we also had some new implementations with uh. prop surfing. So towards the end of the game, you can use a box to help you drop through a depth barrier instead of warping around the stairs, and it saves quite a bit of time. It's like 20 seconds, but it's not easy, and the box can easily break, so it's kind of a risky thing to do. But the time save is always worth the risk, especially when it's this cutthroat towards the top of the leaderboard with this competition. Unity, later on that day, was the first one to use that, the prop surfing in a run, and he got a world record with it with a 23 minute, 51 second run. He's coming, by the way. Sub 24? Let me go! Do I do the optimization? I'm gonna do the nape boost. <laughs> no! <laughs> Fuck! Oh, I got a auto split. <laughs> GG. <laughs> oh my god. And then uh, continued to go on an absolute fucking rampage here. He then got a 23 minute, 39 second run. That's so disappointing. Man. A 23 minute, 14 second run. I forgot to do the fucking optimization. <sighs> a 23 minute, 10 second run. And then finished off that day with a 22 minute, 57 second run. Holy. So now we're 11 days into the competition and we're still not done finding and using huge tricks. So Mars skip was found and this one is such an absolute cluster fuck of a trick. This combines like everything all together, everything ever learned throughout the entire history of the human race gets combined into this fucking skip basically. I guess not the skip so much, but really the whole level of Mars is such a wild experience to watch. Because there's so much going on all the time. Even outside of what I'm about to talk about with the box launches, there's just some really precise jumps that need to be done, as well as like enemies that they fight through that could just instantly kill you sometimes for no fucking reason. But like there's a jump you have to make off of a plant sphincter, like there's this little anus plant that you have to do a pretty tight jump on that actually becomes a run killer for quite a few great runs. Like, there's just nothing easy about it. It is just unforgiving. But let's talk about the Mars skip using the boxes. So, this uses very similar tech to the elevator skips. Um, it's carrying over momentum and uses that to launch you. And you can launch extremely far by using the boxes on Mars. So what you do is you use grenades to prevent the boxes from opening, and then you detonate them at the right time to give you a huge launch, kind of like the elevator skips. So you can use either remote grenades or pressing them as you load a save that you made on the box, or just blow them up by using your grenade launcher. It's just, there's quite a few ways of doing it, but they're all pretty fucking tough. Unity's the first one to use them in a good run. He gets a 22 minute, 53 second record with it. And once again, is trailblazing this path. There's also another thing that gets discovered called propless. So this is kind of similar to something we talked about, but without a prop. So instead of using a box to skip that death barrier we talked about a moment ago, you jump on the wall and time your frame limiter correctly to take much less fall damage. And if you do it correctly, you can just drop to the bottom without carrying a box. And this is just kind of a different way of doing the same thing. Since the box could break and it'd be like this giant fuck you moment, this is just another option. It's just a little bit more difficult. So now let's dive back into the records we were experiencing. Uh, you're gonna notice yet again the patterns continuing. Unity gets another world record with a 22 minute 31 second speed run. Unity comes back because he was mad at Unity and said, I want Unity to do better, so he did, with a 22 minute 19 speed run. But now, now we're getting into some dicey territory. Since the competition's winding down, we're coming up on day 13, Muty actually sneaks in a world record of his own, taking it from Unity. Muty comes in with a 21 minute 58 second speed run. Please don't fucking blow it up. No, we Okay, thank God. Okay. 
Let's see if we still have It's only minus four, chill. Fresh meat. Stop. That's, that was 21. That was fucking 21. Let's fucking go. Let's fucking go. There's a fucking 21, dude. Finally, I get to fucking break a minute barrier, too. Oh my god. Getting close to the buzzer here. We're in the fucking fourth quarter, the final stretch, and Muti just took the world record. So, Unity may have started sweating a little bit, but not that much because he came back and still got another world record with 21 minutes, 27 seconds. This game's similar to Crisis, yeah, you could say that. It's a real gem from its era. I was fucking scared that I literally wouldn't make it in time for the elevator then. And then we started seeing yet another new piece of tech being used called Corp Launch. You can launch your corpse into the next cutscene and load your last checkpoint, which has a car sitting in it to reset the state similar to a wormhole, which teleports you forward and skips a walking section, which saves around 20 seconds. Yet another 20 second time save is still being discovered and used towards the end of these runs, and it does make all the difference in the world. To do the corpse launch, you need an assault rifle, so it's a little slower than the 20 seconds, but even still, it's another time save that starts getting used. Unity comes back again. He gets a 21 minute, 12 second run. That's not a gold, but GG, fuck. Oh, I want the fucking sub 21, man. And then we get our final world record. Our very first sub 21, Unity gets an absolutely historic 20 minute, 58 second run that combines everything ever. Everything the community had learned over the course of 14 excruciating days of discovery and trials and tribulations, Unity combines into a masterpiece of a run. How do I make hair? So now, taking a look at the final three. The final three that will be getting $10,000 split amongst them, 6,000 to first place, 2.5K to second, and 1.5K to third. Unity with his 20 minute, 58 second run. Muti coming in second with a 21 minute, 15 second run. And I think it's worth mentioning, he had an absolutely banger run right towards the end of this challenge that I was watching live where he almost had a chance of taking world record at the end. So this really did come down to the wire, but Muti gets second place, not far behind with that 21 minute, 15 second run. 
And then third place, we have our first repeat top three uh, performer with Zach777 getting a 21 minute, 34 second run. Zach got second in Amok, now third in Exodus from the Earth. Who knows, maybe he's destined for first in the next one, but Zach, very consistent, great runner, gets third place. And I did mention that this time around I was doing an additional $1,000 to whoever found the most meta-defining trick. The trick that saves the most time and is the most important to the run, which the community of course has a strong say in. And the winner of that $1,000 goes to On Trigger for putting everything together to create and optimize Chapter 13 skip to make all of that work. So On Trigger is the recipient of the $1,000 bonus there. And another thing I'd like to mention is there's another runner I haven't talked about, but was a huge runner in this category, Kisimov. Hope I'm not fucking up their name. I don't know if it's Kisimov, Kisimov. Uh, I, I hope I'm not butchering it. But Kisimov had an incredible run, just like Muti did, right at the end of the competition. On day 14, with only, I think, like 20 minutes left, Kisimov was on an absolutely outrageous pace. But unfortunately, it wasn't meant to be. Kisimov finished the competition in fourth, just barely. But right after the competition ended, Kisimov got first place and is right now the current world record holder for Exodus from the Earth. But it, that was in overtime. That that was that was post game. That was the end credits epilogue scene right there. So <laughs> wasn't enough to get the prize placing. But I do want to shout them out because they're an extraordinary runner who is now the world record holder for this game. Overall, this competition was amazing. This was one of the most fun speedruns I got to watch. All of the tech, all of the discoveries being rapidly Bro, found in the so Discord good. server every single day, everyone working together to optimize and improve and push it to its absolute limits. I couldn't be more satisfied with how this worked, and I'm extremely excited for the next $10,000 speedrun challenge. I haven't fully decided on what that next game is going to be, but I will announce it shortly once this video goes up. I really appreciate all the runners for putting so much time into this, and it was a lot of fun to watch. I hope you all enjoyed it, and I hope to see a lot of more repeat return runners for the next one that we do. And uh, yeah, that's about it. See ya. Bro, this is this this hair stop, bro. This 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 hair, bro. Holy cum buckets! I like it. I like it. I like the hair. I like the hair. Wait, what? Uh, uh, uh. I like the hair, bro. Oh my god! This is the first time that ever happened to me. Oh my god, I made it in the wrong. I made it in the wrong. Fuck. I made it in the wrong uh, layer. Shite.
I fixed it, I fixed it. Cryptocurrency. Wait, can I watch this on Twitch? Uh, I don't know. Today we're going to talk about why the Tucker Carlson Fox News situation just isn't adding up. We correct the Mr. Beast misinformation going viral. We break down why grown men are threatening six-year-old girls just searching for their lost kitty cats and so much more. This what is the, the Philip fuck? DeFranco Show. Let's just jump into it. Starting with, schools in Flint, Michigan are taking a unique approach to gun safety. Right? Because there's this fear of kids bringing guns or other weapons to school. And so what they're doing <laughs> is just outright banning backpacks. And this policy reportedly All lasts right. at least until the end of the year. And the superintendent saying, backpacks make it easier for students to hide weapons, which can be disassembled and harder to identify or hidden in pockets inside books or under other items. So now instead, students are allowed to store personal items in small purses, bring lunch boxes, or place their gym clothes in clear plastic bags, all of which will be subject to searches. But schools also might not be the place where you have to worry about your kids getting shot the most. Because in recent weeks, we've seen a number of stories of people just being shot because they went up to the wrong house or the wrong car. And the latest of these stories is luckily just an almost situation. And at the center of it, you have Chris Robbins, a Texas meteorologist with a Facebook account called iWeatherNet that dishes out weather news to over 100,000 followers in Dallas, Fort Worth in Atlanta. But this week, he made news for something that didn't have to do with the weather. Tweeting, a child just rang my doorbell. Folks, you do not ring doorbells in 2023. My six was loaded. Keep your kids away. Signed, Chris. So as you might expect, there was a lot of backlash here. With people saying things like, stand your ground isn't meant for that, and the way you're nearly threatening anyone, specifically kids, is disgusting and why some people shouldn't have guns. To which he replied, I'm not fucking around. So after that, more and more criticism poured in, with Robinson repeatedly updating his original post with more details, saying the kid who rang his doorbell was a little girl looking for her kitten. As 
if that somehow made him look better. And then adding, this is not 1972. If that brat rings my doorbell again tomorrow, I will call the police. Take notes. And honestly, I was like, please tell me I'm being pranked right now. Because the hole that he was digging himself just kept getting deeper and deeper. With him saying that he warned the girl not to ring the doorbell again, or he might pull her hair, causing her to cry. With him later even linking to an article about that 84-year-old white man who shot a 16-year-old black teen in Missouri when the boy rang the wrong doorbell. Where he finally clarifies, for the record, I never threatened a six-year-old. Which I think that's when you know you're in a rough spot. You're like, I need to clarify. I did not threaten murder to the six-year-old looking for a kitten. And adding, I helped her find her kitten. We got her kitten back. Do not ring doorbells in 2023. Which, yeah, unfortunately may actually be very good advice if we have trigger-happy gun nuts like this motherfucker. Good luck to all you Postmates drivers out there. Jesus. And then, this news, these leaks, the, the general narrative around this whole Tucker Carlson Fox News situation doesn't make sense to me. Right, we've talked about it on the show. Tucker and Fox News going their separate ways. It's a mutual decision, wink, wink. Right, with how unexpected the announcement was, it seems pretty obvious that there was a pushing out. But also since then, there have been these leaks around Tucker Carlson, some videos, some text messages, a number of them being used as examples of why Fox News decided, you know what, enough is enough. But the content of these things don't seem to genuinely match up with why they would get rid of their cash cow. Or whether people love him or hate him, you cannot deny his numbers. Like in one of the videos, a bombshell. He's got on camera wanting to wear a suit in a video and he's bashing Fox Nation as like a terrible website, okay? And then today you have the New York Times reporting on a text that was included in a redacted court filing in the Dominion's defamation suit against Fox News. And while in the filings the text is entirely blacked out, the contents were disclosed to the Times in interviews with several people close to the defamation lawsuit. And per the Times, Tucker sent a message to one of his producers in the hours following the January 6th insurrection. And in it, Carlson describes how a video he had recently watched of a group of Trump supporters violently attacking what he called an Antifa kid had brought up conflicting emotions for him. Writing, jumping a guy like that is dishonorable, obviously. It's not how white men fight. Yet suddenly I found myself rooting for the mob against the man, hoping they'd hit him harder, kill him. I really wanted them to hurt the kid. I could taste it. Then somewhere deep in my brain an alarm went off. This isn't good for me. I'm becoming something I don't want to be. The Antifa creep is a human being. Also adding he needs to remember that people love this kid and would be sad if he died and concluding. If I don't care about those things, if I reduce people to their politics, how am I better than he is? Right and from that, people focused on two parts. The first being the kind of bloodlust and then the pullback of like, oh, whoa, I'm, my mind's going to a scary place. But also two, a lot of people focused on that it's not how white men fight part. And that being one of the main things popping up at headlines today. But I have to say with this, even if you are disgusted with that statement, it does not make sense that Fox News would go, yeah, that's the line, right? This is a man who largely made a career out of going, hey, old white people, scary brown people are sneaking into the country. They're gonna steal your jobs. They're gonna do God knows what to your daughter. You're being replaced, right? If you're the Fox News higher ups, like that's not a different guy in the text messages than the guy that you platform to millions of Americans every day, right? So far, the only different guy we've seen in text messages and on screen is when he's like, I hate Trump. Can't wait to not have to deal with this guy anymore. Or the stuff he was saying about Dominion, that not matching to what he was saying on TV, right? And so all of that brings me back to you, there has to also be something else happening. Something else at play. Because this idea that the text message making the rounds today, like that was just too far for Fox News, it doesn't add up. And then, and a lot of you hitting up the text line saying, hey, you gotta update the Chris Tyson, Mr. Beast situation. With people saying that Mr. Beast kicked Chris Tyson off of his team. Right, with this apparently happening after all the controversy over the last couple of weeks. With tons of people attacking Chris online after they revealed they're on HRT. And a number of conservatives specifically angling those attacks at Mr. Beast himself. And when we saw Mr. Beast come to Chris's defense, you had fans going, hey, we're noticing that Chris is not as involved in recent videos and started to wonder if Mr. Beast asked Chris to leave. And actually regarding that, you had Chris release a video. I pretty much told Jimmy, um, just because I want to spend time with Tucker and he's traveling a lot, I'm just going to come and go as I please. I came to Japan and I left when I pleased. Chris also saying the same thing happened at a trip to Mexico, right? Joining and leaving on their own time. And so when I watched that video, I got confused because apparently for a number of people online, they saw this video as evidence that Mr. Beast fired Chris, which does not actually appear to be the case. In fact, Twitter even had to add fact-checking context on some of these posts, noting, hey, what you're saying Chris is saying in this video, he's literally not saying. And honestly, I gotta say with the amount of attention Chris has gotten with this, it absolutely makes sense that they might wanna pull back and focus on some family. So yeah, that's the update, that there's really not much of an update, except that currently it looks like there's just misinformation being spread. And then, so you know how yesterday we talked about Pornhub blocking people in Utah from accessing the site? Right, because starting today, legally adult sites in the state will be required to verify that users are 18 or older, with a law requiring a government ID. And while I can't speak to how many people that stopped from consuming pornography, I can speak to uh, how many people Googled VPN yesterday, with people in Utah absolutely scrambling to get some VPN goodness in their life. It's almost like all those companies and those experts that said that trying to age gate the content in this way, that it's not going to work, that they were right crazy but in completely unrelated news i want to take the time again to remind you of the importance of cybersecurity and more reasons that you'd want it so thank you nordvpn or more
I guarantee. And then, if you're old enough to operate a Nintendo Switch, you're old enough to operate the line. That appears to be the general mindset behind some of this child labor news today. With the Department of Labor recently investigating three different McDonald's franchises across Kentucky, Indiana, Maryland, and Ohio, totaling 62 different stores. And they found that the franchises employed 305 minors who were working more than the permitted hours and completing tasks unfit for their age. In fact, one of the owners, Bauer Food in Louisville, they reportedly had two 10-year-olds that were employed but not paid and sometimes working as late as 2 a.m. one of them even found to be working the deep fryer. Though the majority of the miners were working for Archways Ridgewood based in Walton, Kentucky. Them having a total of 242, 14, and 15 year olds working more than the legally allowed hours. It's obviously less insane than 10 year olds working a deep fryer at 2 a.m., but still, concerning. And it's getting big enough that the senior vice president and chief people officer at McDonald's USA had to say, these reports are unacceptable, deeply troubling, and run afoul of the high expectations we have for the entire McDonald's brand. And a key thing to take away here is this is just a small part of a trend. With the Department of Labor reporting, there has been an uptick in child labor violations. In fact, since 2018, they've seen a 69% increase in children being employed illegally. And keep in mind... Wait, 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 wait. So you telling me a child can get a job and I can't? Wait, that's not bad. Either way, that's horrible. But I'm trying to find a job and I cannot find a job. And then somewhere in these states, they're employing minors. They're employing minors. I, I can't. It sucks, but at the same time, I'm trying to get a job and I'm listening to minors. I'm listening to people with experience, that's normal, but I'm listening to people with no experience and literally don't get paid. I'm looking for a job. I'm literally looking for internships. Internships, I work for experience, not for payment, and I cannot get an internship. I can't even get that. Fine, that's on top of the recent push for rollbacks and child labor laws. Also, these people who are higher minors suck garbage with all that said a question i want to tack on to this story caught and arrested after a days long manhunt according yeah, to the good. county sheriff greg capers the man was caught hiding in a closet underneath some laundry in a home a few miles from the location of the attack and adding that the suspect has now been charged with five counts of murder and is being held on a five million dollar bond with this we also got an update to the story around texas governor greg abbott where he this week faced a lot of backlash after posting a statement where he described the five victims as illegal immigrants with him now retracting that claim after many accused him of attempting to undermine the lives lost by dehumanizing and needlessly bringing up their immigration status as kind of a dog whistle and a spokesperson from his office telling reporters any loss of life is a tragedy and our hearts go out to the families who have lost a loved one but also going on to say the federal officials had told the governor's office that the victims were in the country illegally and adding we've since learned that at least one of the victims may have been in the united states legally we regret if the information was incorrect and detracted from the important goal of finding and arresting the criminal though with how unnecessary it was to mention the alleged legal status of the people who were murdered you still had a lot of people saying this was a piss poor apology for him having a mask off type of situation and then this is a weird one the, the texas state senate just passed a bill that will give the politically appointed secretary of state the power to over overturn the election. But a key thing here, just for the state's largest county, which has coincidentally, I'm sure, increasingly become bluer and bluer, making it a democratic stronghold. With the legislation written so that the new rule applies to counties with populations higher than 2.7 million. And Harris County, which includes Houston, is the only county that meets the threshold with nearly 4.7 million residents. And the second largest county in the state coming in at just 2.6 million residents, and that's Dallas County. How subtle. And as far as the specifics of the bill, it would give the Secretary of State, who is currently a Republican, the ability to throw out election results if at least 2% of polling places run out of ballot paper for more than an hour. But very importantly, according to reports, the Secretary of State wouldn't actually have to prove that any polling places actually ran out of balance. They would merely need to have good cause to believe that there was a shortage. And additionally, they wouldn't have to prove that election administration issues affected the outcome of the election. And notably, if that does happen, another election would need to be held. But with that, we know for a fact that turnout is almost always much lower in recalls or runoffs, especially in states where Republicans are imposing laws and making it increasingly harder to vote. And so if this bill is signed, massive, massive news with huge implications for the third largest county in America. And then, Democrats are taking steps to pass a debt ceiling increase bill without Republican support. And in a letter yesterday, House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries said that the Democrats plan to file a discharge petition, which if you don't know, because why the hell would you, is a procedural motion that would effectively force a vote on a debt limit increase if it's signed by a majority of 218 House members. A move that would allow Democrats to push forward a clean bill rather than a version passed by Republicans a few weeks ago. And that notably would raise the debt ceiling for a year in exchange for billions of dollars in cuts, rolling back key parts of Biden's agenda, further restricting social programs, and increasing 
including mining and fossil fuel production. But a small but also massive thing here, a discharge petition would still require at least five Republicans to sign on. While you literally have hundreds of House members, this could still be difficult given that even moderate GOP members are standing firm in the party's demand that Democrats negotiate with them. But this is Biden and Democratic leadership have repeatedly argued that Congress must pass a clean version of the bill with no Republican conditions, and also accusing the Republican Party of holding America hostage to advance their wish list agenda. And as all this plans out, the country is inching closer and closer to catastrophe, with the Treasury Secretary warning that the U.S. could hit the debt ceiling sooner than expected and as early as June 1st. And then, the Biden administration is worried about our southern border and just struck a deal with Mexico to help keep people out. And that's because on May 11th, the Trump era Title 42 immigration restrictions for COVID were due to end, with the administration reportedly fearing that this would trigger unprecedented migration flows, so it rolled out a plan to send out troops to the southern border. And it now formalized a deal that would keep asylum seekers from Cuba, Venezuela, Haiti, and Nicaragua from living in the U.S. while their cases are pending. And it reportedly doing so by housing many of them in Mexico, which agreed to accept 30,000 people per month as long as the U.S. did the same. Although that number is misleading. The 30,000 that the U.S. accepts have to be part of a parole program where they apply from overseas and have a U.S.-based sponsor, which is very different from how it normally works where asylum seekers just show up on your border. That is the group that Mexico would be taking. The deal also leaves a lot of questions such as what's going to happen to migrants from places like El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras who don't have a U.S.-based sponsor and are seeking asylum. But no matter what, it feels very much like we're going to be talking about the southern border a lot as Title 42 comes to a close. And understandably, there are a lot of questions about how this is actually going to look. And then, is Russia lying again? I mean, usually there's an easy answer to that. But that's also something being asked after the Kremlin was seemingly hit by two drone strikes last night. Now, notably, only superficial damage was done, but Russian authorities were quick to claim that it was an assassination attempt on Putin by Ukraine. But with that, most people are very skeptical. With U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying that while he couldn't verify the story either way, he would take anything Russia says with a very large shaker of salt. Others also claiming that it was unlikely to be an attempt on Putin since Ukraine tracks his whereabouts and knew that he wasn't there at that time. And with that, some suggesting that if it was, in fact, Ukraine, this was more of a show of force to Russians that they can target them at home. Or what we're seeing a larger amount of people saying is that it's more likely to be a false flag to justify targeting Zelensky, which I mean, we've already seen. Be all that? brings us to the end of today's show. Thank you for being a part of another daily dive into the news that you need to know. As always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.
only want to live forever And I died Is this good? There is no I'm alive, 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 Okay, so the head is the thing I'm I'm bad at. I can do a perfect good somewhat perfect good body. Just the head is what I'm having problems with. I cannot do a egg shaped head, whatever it is, and the face. The face Thank you, Merlin. If you ever seen this bot or whatever, thank you. What did you mean to do the nose? The mouth and the eyes, that's what I need to learn. But for now, as far as I can tell, I can do a body. Because I like it. I like it. The titties, this. I like it. The body figure. I like it. The figure. I like it. The rim. Yeah, I'm gonna upload this as uh, to uh, Twitter. I'm uploading this to Twitter. And to my... Mm. 
into my Discord as well. Oh my god. Good thing I didn't open Twitter on stream. What the fuck? The first thing they came in. Oh my god. Whoa, the power of cuteness. Ah, it's so cute, the end. Holy. Wait, this person went on a billion stream? Holy. And she's, she's growing. Good thing. I found her when she was only like two people, and now she's growing bigger, better, faster, stronger. <laughs> I like the protagonist of Hong Cairo is a trace of fucking rack with a trash meme and everything lol Okay, I'm uploading it. I'm uploading it. Oh my god So much hentai on my Twitter thread Oh my God. Oh. My. God. I'm not really I'm just like going, oh. My. God. Tweet. I had to find a folder. Oh, never mind. I found it. I found it. I have it. I said work. Whip. No. What the fuck? Whip. What the fuck? What? What was that person? Okay, dot dot dot. Hashtag anime art. Hashtag art. I'm gonna put hashtag Twitch as well. Twitch. Twitch art doesn't exist. Uh, Twitch. Oh my god, my Twitter is full of. Oh my god, the girl from Blue Archive. Oh my god. God, uh, oh my! God. I need to clean my Twitter, bro. What the fuck? So embarrassing. Ew, Twitter blue. That's just YouTuber still follows me. Oh yeah, she still follows me. Probably muted me, muted my ass. <laughs> Probably muted my ass. <laughs>
Yeah, she was on a Philian stream. Uh, how do I find this? Uh oh. Yes, I chop a faco. Anybody else? Anything new? I watch hentai. Yes. Anything new? Oops. Fill in. Is it double L or one L? Oh, one L. Wait, was it this? Wait, which feeling was it? This happened one hour ago. That tweet was from one hour ago. It's probably this bot from seven hours ago. <coughs> Alright, three, two, one. Let's watch. Act with the Asian girl. Oh. Well intentions are you right. fine well dead sea what brings you here today oh my god that uh, boy <laughs> oh i'm not gonna lie are you I am chair was in the wrong spot are you affiliated on twitch i'm a partner all right oh god she's a partner she's double clouded okay sounds good all right holy well, it's time for me to spin this god dang wheel in your name and your honor sprixer let us thank see you, what we get you. it could be one <laughs> i got the cute no, you! Okay. Whoa, yeah, did she yeah. is. All right, Nihongo. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming on this stream, Ren Chan. It has been a blessing. Thank you. Chan. Did she is. Sayonara. So cringe. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Holy. Uh, me using my five Japanese words I learned from anime to try and converse with an actual <laughs> Japanese fluent person. I feel like, I feel like I'm having I feel, <laughs> she was cute as a prick. I then we'll do it. All right, let me come over here. One second. Okay. Oh boy, here we go. Um, here. Wazam. Oh my Wazam. God, what? Here. Oh man. Wait a minute. Right, we're gonna spin over here. One second. Okay. Oh boy, here we go. Um, here. Wazam. I can't. Wait, zoom in the hand. I can't see. It's so blurry. Zoom in the hands. 1080. Well, bam. Well, bam. Here. All right. Let me come over here. One second. Okay. Oh, boy. Here we go. Um, Here. Well, bam. S. P. Rixer. Come on. There we go. Oh my god, she's partnered. She's partnered. Holy follow. There we go. Bam. Well, bam. Well, bam. All right, let's see what we got in. Uh, June? Yeah, stay here. Yeah. Okay. Money. <laughs> money. <laughs> you know, you know, a, out of all the English to know, she knows the word bunny suit. No way. Okay. <laughs> okay. Money. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bunny suit for ten minutes. No way, bro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, 10 minutes. That's all you get. 10 up, 10 effing minutes. God dang it, bro. Here. 10 minutes. Okay, are you ha- are you <laughs> Oh my. Smart businesswoman, all right. Hey, yo. Frick, a kawaii. All right. <laughs> hey, knock it in. She has dead physics. No, you! Okay. I'm a physics. Yep, yep. Alright, Nihongo. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for coming on the stream, Arenchan. It has been a blessing to hear from you. Oh, I can't believe. Right. I didn't. I didn't want any oh, part of yeah, it, right? That's, so, that's what uh, I would have done. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then I thought to myself. Oh. There's, there's a time and a place whenever, for a hero, whenever, right? Whenever, like, it's not here. So I kept walking, anyways. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I, 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 I thought about it and I double backed. Okay, Basically. I went back. I went back to the, to the lovely lady who uh, was showing me her booty, and uh, I, I, you know, I'm like, you been at conflict with, and. What the and, fuck is that? Discord trying so to cool. uh, Things are coming a better day. Okay. I, I, at All least right. like, oh, yo, what's up? Let's see what we're working with. Okay. Insert the unzipping sound right here. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All the founding fathers. Uh. No, no, I did it. No, I did it. I think you see. I need you. I, I would like to. I would like to. <laughs> this is so cringe. <clears throat> what the fuck? Uh, I, I would like to. I, I really wanted to riz you up, you know? I, I wanted oh, to test out my rizzing skills. Uh -huh. Live. Wait! Mm. Does the mouth. Yeah, what? I control the mouth? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the hedgehog! Oh, you're a hedgehog, of course. Wow! Of course. Look at me go! Look. Uh -huh. I'm gonna eat your poop. Not yours, the one Bruh. over there. God! I'm such a. Like What's up, extra Lena? Bean? Caveat, yeah, yeah. A little anti feminist, maybe, but. Whenever, whenever. Oh my, that's a cool VTuber. Oh my god, I see all these cool VTubers. I'm like, I'm so cringe. I'm not one of those cool VTubers. I'm doing this shitty shit art. <sighs> oh, they almost got banned. The thing was bunny, bunny suit. I'm doing this shit. I want to become like this from before to after, but uh, one day, one day, one day I'll reach there. One day I'll reach. One day I'll become funny. Yeah. One day. I'm just gonna keep dreaming on and on. Nothing gonna get accomplished. I'm just gonna work a dead end job. Watching this on TikTok every single every single fucking time. While a significant number of Fallout 3 players will likely complete the Wasteland Survival Guide quest, it's quite possible that many will overlook a unique encounter that can be found in the game after beating the quest. Greetings, fellow survivor. Another fine day in the wastes, isn't it? Why shouldn't I be? I've got food, I've got shelter. And I know humanity is on the rise again. Haven't you heard the good news? Haven't you read the Wasteland Survival Guide? Glory be! You're the great survivor! Bless you! Oh, bless you for sharing your wisdom with mankind! You've given us all a chance to hope again. Oh yes, of course. Please accept this. It's all I have. But surely I owe everything to the lessons in your holy guide. Bless you. Why would you want to join a fascist paramilitary organization? While a significant number of oh. my back, oh, my back. <laughs> Whoever said to romanticize your life is a liar. I went to the cafe to draw so I can touch grass and romanticize. We finally get to see the results from our experiment. Four weeks ago, I made a video smashing open a water graded video game. The goal was to send it back to water games and see if I can get a higher grade on the same game. The original grade it got was 9.6A+, which if you guys aren't familiar with the water scale is actually a very good grade. It's near the top. The only way it could be better is a 9.8 or an A++ seal rating. And of course, 
course, it could always come back with a worse grade, which would be a complete waste of my time and money. I slowly begin opening the box. My heart has never been beating faster. I sent in some other cool games like Dark Souls. Stop getting distracted. We're here for one thing and one thing only. Bingo. We got the goods. The moment of truth. The new grade on 999 oh, is... Ah, it once again did receive a 9.6A plus the same exact grade. So props to the Wait, grading nine, company nine, nine. for getting it correct. But that's $40. I will never get Juice World Angel number risk. I don't know what. Oh my god, game. Pinnacle of immersive storytelling. Can I play this on my This PC? video will contain gigantic Clover, a younger girl and the sister of Snake, Junpei or Jumpy as Wait, triangle. By Akane, Wait, a I can play this. Of Junpei, Seven, a tough guy suffering from a case of amnesia, Lotus, a smart and quick to anger woman if her age is brought into question, and the knife man who uh dies almost immediately. Which actually establishes Let's a very go. grave tone quite early in the narrative. Oh, As I mentioned previously, mystery. the goal of these individuals, as dictated by Zero, is to travel through the numbered doors to find the door marked 9 and escape before the 9 hour went through door 5 on this playthrough. Also, if players perceive the axe ending, then they'll hear some curious dialogue about Ace wanting to show Lotus something, which he would show to Junpei soon after. Keep that in mind. These are just two examples of small details that will either raise new questions for the player to work through or use as evidence to unravel some of the game's feelings comes with finding that What? What an utter mindfuck. The safe ending alludes to a deeper purpose behind the whole game, but it raises so many questions that it leaves the player awestruck and in the state of disbelief. What? Junpei leaves to find Zero, but when he comes back, Akane has outright disappeared, leading to another showcase of unbridled emotion. With our minds blown, Junpei passes out on the floor, and the credits roll, concluding the safe ending. I've played a lot of video games. There's always a great feeling Clover has axe murdered you, so really Santa's sudden action is just another event on the what the hell is going on roller coaster. Much like the safe ending, Junpei and company are able to free Snake from the coffin, but this time Clover is there for a heartfelt reunion and we didn't technically obtain the information from the safe. But happy moments such as these amidst the chaos of the nonary game are welcomed and this scene in particular is strengthened through our knowledge of how this reunion had the potential to never exist. Usually games will play out in a linear fashion, but knowing the potentiality makes the other perspectives more apparent in the mind of the player, which consequently oh, gives the true scene Wait, I can buy it. The group Wait, has a discussion it. about the true identity of Zero, where it is concluded that Santa's bracelet oh, must Steam. actually be a Zero, and it's Akane 6 Steam. must be the result of a flipped 9 If you recall the box art, I always thought the framing of Akane and Junpei's arms allude to her true number. From the base perspective, we have Akane's hand right side up, and Junpei's upside down, although the 5 is still perfectly legible. But what if we were to rotate it so that Junpei's was right side up? The Whoa, information presented to the player six, on six, what was likely to be the introduction to the title holds a twist of its own, and this isn't that far-fetched since 999 isn't the only Zero Escape title to do this. Following the party scanning into the other number 9 door, the final two rooms that lurk on the other side are a colossal library and a messy study. The library's primary function is to reintroduce Rupert Sheldrake and the theory of morphogenetic fields into the player's mind. While the study has a whole list of purposes, but two in particular. A pseudo oh, answer to the location zero of Alice escape or Alice and zero and escape the of what dilemma. happened in the last nonary games nine years ago. Seven sees a picture of the original four members this of the game came out in 2017. Ace, the knife man, the dead man in the captain's quarters, and the last one which is deduced a to be came out in 2017. The picture sparks oh, Seven's memory sell. and shows a tale of how he rescued several kids from the very same incinerator we saw in the safe ending. However, he was unable to save a little girl who Ace grabbed. If you pay close attention to the design of the kids, you'll notice that Santa, known as Oe Kurashiki, Snake, and Lotus's daughter are among them. I think this is a cute detail that gives more life to the scene rather than using shadowed silhouettes. What are you talking about? There's one oddity. 
The name of the girl who they could not save was Akane. Specifically, Akane, Akane no. Okay, Ooh. I personally feel this revelation is when the seeds of doubt 999 has planted have grown uncontrollably. Santa and Akane are siblings? How could Akane possibly be here today if she died nine years ago? Is Junpei in love with a ghost? Much like I stated earlier, 999's strength as a narrative partly feeds on the player's reactions to situations and creating a web of possibilities. Ultimately, Junpei and company reach the incinerator, where the next set of bombs are done. Santa is truly Aoi Kurashiki, but he's merely an assistant to Zero, and the notary games were designed to save someone rather than simple revenge. I feel a lot of its charm is stripped away with the omission of two screens. And the image- I teared up. On the final puzzle, 999 broke me. Concerning the Nonary games, its version of the puzzle to me lacks much of the impact and weight that the DS version so masterfully captures. The puzzle was changed from a Sudoku to a simple fill-in-the-blank board puzzle, and the duality of Akane and Junpei's roles is lost in the translation. While I still view the Nonary games version as a suitable method of experiencing this title in a Password. much more convenient and flexible manner, these changes in the final act are what I believe hurt this version and make the DS version stand out as the definitive one. After submitting ah. the answer to Akane, the two have this moment of disbelief and pure password. elation at their success. There's a couple lines where Akane just takes in the joy of being alive and says her heart felt like it would burst every time she thought of him. Even Junpei has a line about his heart being on fire, which could be attributed to both the stress and heat of the situation, but his strong desire to save Akane. It strengthened even more when we see a flashback scene to Junpei and Akane talking on a hill before Akane moves away. There's just this Ace tied up in the back in the pursuit of Santa and Akane and Clover behind the wheel. They reflect on the past events nice. and stumble across a familiar looking Ooh. woman standing on the side of the road, thus Oopa. ending 999 and one of my favorite games of all time. But we're left with several questions. Was that woman on the side of the road truly all ice? Where did Akane go? Will Akane and Junpei ever get their happy ending? Well, I think for those. We'll find our answer eventually. Yeah, in fucking 10 years. <laughs> this game came out in 2009. Oh, so we got a 2009 on the DS version. It got a remaster at. This video will contain gigantic size spoilers. And got remastered. To that is referenced to possibly be aboard the ship and Akane's mention of. Wait, it shouldn't all have the one that appeared here. Earlier in the kitchen. Ace tied up in the back in the pursuit of a woman standing on the side of the road. Thus, yeah, that's all ice. That's a, that's a mummy. That's, that's a fucking bitch. Mummy. But we're left with several questions. Was that woman on the side of the road truly all ice? Where did Akane go? Will Akane and Junpei ever get their happy ending? Well. Why can't I, I use the scroll those, here? We'll find our answer eventually. <gasps> hey everyone, Kajor is here. I'm gonna keep this brief since this video has already far exceeded the length of my previous ones, but... Why can't I use my scroll here? Oh, because it's loading, I'm stupid. I cannot believe Crunchyroll, they up- wait, there's a review? Oh, Star Wars Vision came out. But I cannot believe Crunchyroll, they uploaded the fucking Megumi's first explosion clip. Uh, shame on them. Anyway, yeah, that's the end of the stream. I'll close this shit. I'll the end of the stream, I'm clocking out. Another day, another stream, am I right? <laughs> I hate myself. Oh, now this is broken. Oh, now this is broken. Oh my god, everything is broken now. Everything is broken. I cannot believe this. Hey, what happened if I close this?
Uh, yeah, that's him. I, I think I know wallpaper. Wait, was in there? Uh, I forgot. Anyway, bye bye. Tomorrow. Ah, yes. I, I remember. I need to work on the schedule. A consistent streaming schedule. <laughs> I need to do that. Nah, I just keep my word for now. So tomorrow I'm gonna play. I don't know. Continue trying or play a game. I have no idea. Alright, that's the end of the stream. Bye.